the beauty of the city never changed. For a time, things were certainly different. Fields empty for a reason, but spirit never broken. Lack of games did not stop a desire to help out in the community. And now, as we peer out the other side, everyone has been helping out, no matter who you are. Man, I love this place. I gotta make sure I get this right. I wanna have the perfect dice. This is such a great sports town. We are ready to go. Hi everybody and welcome to the 2021 Port Coquitlam Sports Awards. We're outside the Terry Fox Theater, where in previous years we've obviously been inside. I've loved emceeing this event because it really is a celebration. Everyone gets dressed up, we've got the red carpet out there, and we celebrate all the work that people put into sports. So obviously things have been different in the last 16 months, but that did not dampen the spirit and the committee and all the commitment that people made to making this city better. So that's exactly what we are going to do. Celebrate what people have done over the last 16 months. We find it with the volunteers who have stepped forward. We find it with the community leaders who have done exactly that, lead through these tough times. We will also celebrate the volunteers. And as we always do in the Poco Sports Awards, we will induct three new members into the Port Coquitlam Sports Hall of Fame. So let's begin with a group of girls, U11 hockey players, who saw an opportunity to raise money, saw an opportunity to give back, and did exactly that. It's one of our great community teams. It was more difficult than usual for sure. Um, we as a, as a group of coaches spent a lot of time just trying to come up with what can we do to make it exciting? What can we do to, to make it more fun? And uh, without being able to have any battle drills, without having any games, without having any contact, uh, it was so difficult to play the game of hockey and have the girls enjoy the game of hockey. So we did some other interesting things, like we came up with games of foosball, um, how you can play foosball on the ice, you know, how can you play tag, uh, you know, we dodge ball, bring the balls out and start throwing them at each other and stuff like that. And uh, we had the skate-a-thon as well. Um, skate-a-thon was received very well by parents and players to go, okay, what do I have to do? Or is it big explaining for it was, it was uh, absolutely on fire from the time we started it. It, it took off with our team. And then we threw out the challenge to a couple of other teams in the association. And within the period of about two days, it went from an idea that uh, Coach Pete had to almost the entire association taking part. So we had uh, almost all the, all, all the teams up to U13, U15 um, involved in the skate-a-thon. Well, I called all my relatives on the phone and then I skated. How, how, how long did you skate for? Um, an hour. How many laps? A hundred and I did a hundred and twenty-five. Um, it felt happy, uh, but at the end of it, I felt really tired. <laughs> they, you know, knew enough about COVID to know that it was impacting families. You know, even potentially families within our own association, and just to see their excitement and um, the efforts they put into fundraising. Um, my daughter went door to door in our neighborhood and was able to collect over $800 um, just with, with her hustle. And so it's the same hustle we see with them on the ice. Um, so I think they, they saw that and they felt the, the pride and the reward of it, um, of, of giving back. So I think, um, yeah, I think it was great. Congratulations to the Predators. What a wonderful season, one they will always remember for giving back. You know, we will honor three community leaders throughout this show. And the first is someone who probably spent an awful lot of time in this lacrosse box and still does. Find any other lacrosse box, find a lacrosse field, find a lacrosse stick, you will likely find Josh Wall. He has been the president of Poco Saints Lacrosse for the last 10 years, but he grew up playing the game in Poco, coaching and helping in every which way he could. His love for the game, very evident when he talks about what lacrosse means to him here in Poco. I 
I guess when I was just out of high school, I, I stopped playing for a while, but I want to stay in the game, so I started coaching right away in, in probably 94. And uh, I just fell in love with coaching after that and, and have been doing it ever since. What do you like about it? Just giving back to the game. I love the game. I like the kids. Uh, you know, you, uh, meeting meeting people. Um, you know, just being involved in the game and and being able to still be part of it after you couldn't play anymore. And so. Do you? There's not really been a lack of success for what you've done, but I, I think it seems like a lot of coaches go in and and hey, it's nice to win. You got kids trying hard, mm -hmm. but. What do you hope someone would say about Coach Wall if you know they, they finished three or four years later and they're they're now 25, 26? That maybe they learned while they were under your guidance. Um, just same thing. I hope they fall in love with the sport. And um... are there life lessons? <laughs> you can make me. No, no, no. I mean, are, but are there lessons? I mean, I think you just you're playing, you're playing. But I think you, it it probably must be rewarding. If you're rolling into a waves or someone, you see something you haven't seen for three or four years. Do you get that to happen once in a while? Yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, so I gotta compose myself. Oh, that's okay. Hey, the, you know what? The great thing is if you got emotion, that's what means the most. And, and is that emotion coming? Because uh, if I'm gonna hazard a guess, that you probably influence a lot of kids. Yeah, I, I hope so. Is that why you got into it, or just kind of, you got into it because of the sport, and then you realize that you are, you, you can be a big factor for some kids? Yeah, initially that's why, for sure, just because of the sport, and then, you know, seeing kids over the years, and now there's kids who are giving back and coaching themselves, and some of the kids I coached have kids now, and, and just seeing that, and, and, and it continues on, and passing on the torch sort of thing, and, and yeah, it means a lot. Yeah, well, growing up, lacrosse was instantly like our world. I grew a love for the sport just as much as he has a love for as soon as I was old enough to put a stick in my hands. Um, I've grown up with him as my role model, coaching me, helping me figure out sports. If uh, lacrosse is my sport, which it became my sport very quickly, um, and it's our whole family. Like my dad coaches so many teams, obviously. Now I ref, I've helped coach teams too with him. My older brother refs and my younger brothers play. So it's like a family marriage to the sport, I would say. I think just in, in Port Coquitlam, we, you know, the, our club was probably in the 80s before my time, obviously, but it was big. Like lacrosse was a big community sport and those numbers decreased over time. And whether it's people moving out to the valley or or whatever different demographics but now we're trying to build it back up again and so we're out in the community and we're working hard in the schools and we're recruiting and, and getting just people who haven't seen the game involved and then you know we got great numbers right now at the lower level and and our job now is to is to retain those kids and keep them coming back every year. Congratulations to Josh you know now because of Josh's leadership you can find girls lacrosse teams and boys lacrosse teams that wasn't the case back in 1972 Michelle Boyer had to look for a team to play for. The first team was established then. It was exactly what she wanted. She fell in love as soon as she held the lacrosse stick. She went on to represent the city, the province, and the country. And now she goes in to the Poco Sports Hall of Fame. It was an instant love, I think, of um, just to feel the stick and just the things you could do with it, all the kind of neat things. I'd watched the Poco Saints play for, year, play for years, so I, I really enjoyed the game. My parents used to go watch the Admax, uh, the next level up, so it was definitely a game I was familiar with. Where, where do you go from there? Were there teams at that point, girls teams to play, or how do you decide, how can I play this game? I love the stick, love hanging around the house with it, but where do you go? So, uh, high school chum just came to me one time and we had played softball together and that was the only team sport I'd actually played and uh, she said hey they're starting a, a girls team a bantam team in Poco and so I thought oh why not this this could be really fun and I didn't have any equipment so I 
begged and borrowed a few things and, uh, and armored up and off I went to my first practice and I literally just, I was in love with it right from the get-go and yeah, and then the team in Poco lasted a couple years and then after Bantam there wasn't anywhere to go. When you get on that team, and obviously we look at everything that you've won and we'll get to all the accolades, are you kind of the one that goes, wow, like all that time I had the stick in my hand, I kind of know what I'm doing, and was it the other girls trying to figure it out and you already seem to be a little farther down the road, or were you all in the same boat? Uh, I think we were all in the same boat, although I think because I had already been playing around with the stick a fair bit just on my own, I just felt like I kind of had an affinity for it, and so... Um, I ended up being the captain on the team, so you know I don't know if that was indicative of skill level or anything, but uh, yeah, it was a huge honor. And uh, but I practiced probably more than anybody's ever practiced, right down at the Poco box, the outdoor box on Wilson, all day, every day I could. So. Why the drive? Just uh, what got that to you? Because I mean, anybody who's successful at something, it's not just naturally good. There's there's a love or something to say, I'm going to go do that. Why did you likely come home from school and go, hey, I'm just going to the box or throw the ball around? You know, to be honest, I felt the sport actually was quite free uh, because I could do it totally on my own. Uh, you know, it's a team sport, obviously, but practicing, you can just do on your own. I was just completely self-entertained by, um, I formed this little circuit where I would, you know, do this bit of a run first with my stick, practicing the whole way, and then I would get to the box and I'd, practice, practice, right hand, left hand, and different shots. I'd, and uh, I remember one time I was practicing in the box over there and there's a guy that used to come out and watch me in the apartment right next to the lacrosse box. And he one day he says to me, do you have to do that? Because I literally would just be, I'd pick Make a spot on, on the wall, you know, and just hammer. And I, I told him what I was trying to do. And I said, I, I want to be the best player I can be. And, after that, when balls came out of games, like the outdoor games during the week, he'd save them all and I'd get to the box and then all of a sudden these balls would be coming off the guy's balcony. He's throwing me all these extra balls. <laughs> we were instant friends. <laughs> uh, so much success. Did, did you find it, you know, here you are in Poco, you're practicing and then you're on Team BC. At a national level, um, were we ahead of the game as far as BC and, and women's? Or, or was it very competitive when you got to those early national championships? That's what pushed me actually, Perry, to, to work that much harder because uh, by the time I went out to a women's team out in Burnaby, out in South Burnaby, uh, everybody was good. Everybody was such a tremendous athlete. Some of the girls were already in college playing other sports and had played box across for a lot of years. And we had a really great coach, uh, former, well, he's a Hall of Famer himself. Dave Evans used to play for the Vancouver Berards and uh, he he worked us harder than I'd ever been worked by a coach, and uh, he used to bring out the boys from the Brards to do face-off specialty work and defensive specialty work and offense. So um, it was really getting into that better level of competition that really forced me to get better. I don't know if you can answer it, but you take this little area, Burnaby, Coquillum, Park, Coquillum, and you look at the number of Hall of Famers, Canadian Hall of Famers, does, does just success breed success? Does work ethic? Why in this area do we have so many incredible lacrosse players, female, male? Uh, you know, that's that's a great question. Uh, I remember watching some of the greats, like I said, with the Poco Saints. A lot of guys I went to high school with, they were just natural athletes. Um, they didn't just play lacrosse, they played other sports. And I think that's part of it is you've got these uh, people who are just raw, good athletes and uh, are able to pick up pretty much any sport. and. Uh, yeah, so uh, for me, I played other sports. Uh, I never played lacrosse, but for whatever reason, it almost felt kind of instinctive. So what does it mean to be here where you grew up at home and going into the Hall of Fame? Oh, it's uh, a huge honor um, to be inducted into my hometown. I know a lot of the athletes that have been previously inducted, and I know them as athletes, and uh, you know, I am in awe of a lot of those people. So to be in the same, I guess, the same realm, uh, it's, it is a, a very big honor. Congratulations to Michelle on such a wonderful honor for what she has done for this city and what she has accomplished in the sport of lacrosse. You know, it doesn't matter. When you deal with grassroots, when you deal with Port Coquitlam, you have to have volunteers. And this city has so many of them. We would like to honor a few right now.
Kim Horobeck, Poco Skating Club. Jennifer Godin, Port Coquitlam Euro Right FC. Olé, 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 olé. <laughs> Thank you to our volunteers. Jennifer there with the shout out for Poco Soccer. Poco Soccer really is Euro Right. Chris McKinnon, a soccer dad who was approached and said, How can your company help? You know, in Port Coquitlam, you certainly have the athletes, you certainly have the volunteers, but you do need some financial backing. And it was Chris and his Eurorite company that had an idea that really has exploded. And because of that, we honor Chris, we honor Eurorite as our business leaders. We've been in Port Coquitlam for over 25 years. We should uh, do something for the community and give back. And uh, our owner was like, great idea, let's go. Well, we, we talked about uh, being the lead sponsor because the club was, as you know, most sports are, are lacking finances. And, and, you know, my daughter started playing and, and I was looking and, you know, they didn't have proper jerseys and the coaches were, you know, and, you know, just trying to, to raise the level of, uh, of, of sport and, and pride in, in Port Coquitlam, I thought, well, you know, jerseys is one thing, but I said, I want the coaches to look good. I want, uh, I want the field to look good. I don't want holes in the nets. I want to I wanna really raise the bar in Port Coquitlam. So, uh, so that we expanded and, and did an early bird draw. So we did a bathroom makeover and 100% and of the money that's raised goes back to the club. Uh, so you know, is it to this day, is that how you do it? There's always a raffle? There's always a raffle, and we keep we keep growing. We're bringing other other uh, companies in that are you know uh, uh, in the area to to you know kind of beef it up and sell more tickets. Right, uh, lotteries are are complex these days. Even for for charity, there's a lot of uh, we'll just say a lot of uh, requirements. So um, so yeah, we uh, we've been we've been doing it for nearly ten years. We lost a year because of, uh, of the corona. Uh, virus, but uh, we're over. We've raised over seven hundred thousand, um, and a hundred percent of that goes back to the club. So, you know, yeah, we're it went uh, started out as jerseys and coaches' gear and, and equipment, and quickly led to uh, professional instruction. Uh, you know, um, uh, professional instruction for for not only for the kids but also the coaches and uh, and the referees. So there's a, an element there for sure. It was an opportunity that came up at the time, and it was a perfect fit. Um, you know, seeing uh, you know how other companies do it, like Tim Hortons, and the, and the opportunity, and and really, you know, I'm surprised that more businesses aren't stepping up to the plate. And it was a hundred percent give back to the community. We wanted to to truly uh, make our community better. We wanted to uh, make that that experience for the kids. Right, it's all for the kids. Uh, raising that level of, of pride, uh, you know, a supportive, uh, you know, uh, just a, an experience. You know, growing, growing our game is our, our slogan in the club. And in order to do that, unfortunately, it requires some finances. So, uh, you know, and, and it's exploded, really. It's, it's, uh, we now have done over um, uh, $40,000 in scholarships. And, you know, that's our, that's our, uh, our direction. Uh, and and we're uh, we're trying to get new facilities. Our thanks to Chris and thanks to Eurorite and everything they do on the soccer fields here of Port Coquitlam. You know, Chris was saying, and I think a theme is with everybody here in Port Coquitlam. You want kids to play sports. You want them to have a great experience. But you're hoping to create real positive citizens for this city. And a great example is our third community team, and it's the Poco Pirates U21 team. Their last year of hockey, and they couldn't play as many games as they wanted to, but they realized they might be able to help out, just give a little bit back to the community. And most of these players were surprised how the need was right around them in the city that they live in.
last year, even though we had COVID, we only had four games. It was the most fun I had all year in, with a team because we had practices every two weeks. And we just, I said, what do you guys want to do? We just did whatever. We just had fun with it, you know, because fun, you still got to have fun no matter how old they are, right? That's the number one thing you got to bring. You want to teach the kids how to give back. You want to help them become good young people, you know, that are going to be productive in society and stay on the right side of the lot, all this stuff, right? So the sport or the activity isn't really what it's all about. It's about the life lessons. So if you can impart to them some life lessons, we're doing our job. But I wanted to do something for the kids in the community because I found out through osmosis that there's a school lunch program and if those kids don't get a meal at a school, they may not get a meal all day. And it broke my heart. And I just couldn't believe, you know, elementary school kids would be in this kind of predicament. So that's how this ball went rolling. Certainly when Phil, I think you talked about it after the, or on the ice one time, and we were all curious, we were like, $20, yeah, we can all do that, no problem, right? Like, we're playing hockey out here having fun. That $20 isn't a big issue to us, but it, it's, it's incredible, like, if it could buy, like, just a couple meals for someone, make their, like, we couldn't even fathom not, like, I, at least I, I personally can say that I couldn't fathom not having a meal. It's called Help the Kids, like, I didn't really know, like, at first, how, uh, how like, big of an issue it was until, like, we, like, Phil brought it up. And then, like, we all had some conversations. And then, like, Phil having the, handing the money to them and all, like, put a smile on my face. It really just brought to light, like, kind of what a lot of pe kids in Poco and, like, families are going through to give back at that time, like, you know, near Christmas. Um, just even the twenty dollars from each family goes a long way, and you know, to think that forty percent of the kids, you know, wouldn't couldn't have a meal in elementary school, um, it's just it's it's really sad to think about in our in our community. Well, we're we're supposed to be modeling. That's what we're supposed to be doing as coaches, right? So I hope that they'll take something from this and you know give back. This certainly is the crown jewel of Port Coquitlam, their new rec facility. Hey, it's the envy of probably everybody in BC. Glenn Metzel is a Poco boy, born and raised, works for the city, played baseball, loves his sport. But in the last year and a half with COVID, Glenn led the way, making sure protocols were in place, making sure sports could continue in some form in the city, showing that he truly is a community leader. I was humbly honored, um, uh, given that this is something that was a passion. It, it's my job. I enjoy doing, giving back to the community and being a leader in the sport in this community. Um, you know, the last 18 months has been a tough year on everyone. Um, and I think, you know, if we could help sport get back to at least playing, um, the kids back playing, uh, the adults doing some sort of organized activities, I think was a huge help to relieve some of the anxieties and the mental capacity or the mental state that people were going through and experience because of this pandemic. And, and I think anything that we could do to help those organizations get back to sport, safely back to sport, and, and do it, you know, relatively quickly in a turn, you know, quickly turnover and, and help with those safety plans. And I, and I think the relationships that we've built uh, with those groups, you know, and, and helping Ryan and the Sport Alliance, helping with that aspect, uh, the relationships we built with the school district really helped in this and, and the ability to pull everyone together. You know, this city is built on some just incredible people that give back to this community. Um, the volunteerism, you know, the staff that work for the city that I'm fortunate enough to be in, able to go to work with every day and the support they give. Um, the support of senior staff that allow us to do our job on a day-to-day -day basis. And even, the, you know, the vision of mayor and council to bring this town to life, you know, 
a good example is look at the new rec complex we've just built over in um, you know downtown core and um, we're really excited about the opening of that this fall later this fall and you know and, and their commitment to this town and, and rebuilding and building it and, and building it and getting it right so I think Poco has always had this unique small town charm um, you know even their sport had this small town charm yet you know we we always we're always the big the little brother to Coquitlam and, you know and I think you know, through the creation of this alliance, you know, bringing everyone together, I think we came, we got an identity, and we became Poco, and uh, and we became sport in Poco, and I think, you know, that was really rewarding to see you know, the fruition of the creation of the alliance and how we've come to the sports awards, how we've created our Hall of Fame, we've been able to recognize those builders, those athletes that have contributed to this community, you know, and it's in essence we we still continue to grow. We've just seen the tip of what this of what this community can do. Ah, the penalty box. You don't want to be there, but you are because someone is telling you you broke the rules. Someone is a referee giving up their time. Dan Borma was exactly that. Dan Borma was a guy who will tell you he was a doer. Created the first girls hockey here in the Port Coquitlam area. Made sure Old Timers Hockey League was going, one of the first in Western Canada. If he saw a problem, he solved it. And that is why Dan is going into the Port Coquitlam Sports Hall of Fame. biggest thing is the camaraderie. It's just like today um, and that I started playing hockey with guys that I played uh, fastball against mm -hmm. and that's so we knew each other from Tulowski Stadium and and uh, places in Burnaby mm -hmm. and and that and then those those carried on um, to the to the point and and now a lot of my golfing friends are all my ex uh, hockey friends and and baseball friends. It's it's relationships so, from, from so the relations keep relationships keep on going no matter what age you are. You couldn't say girls hockey back in the seventies, could you? Like they just it didn't exist. Well, no, we were the first league in Western Canada. Why did you decide to go, we need this? Um, well, number one, my daughter wanted to play hockey and there was nowhere for her to play. And the boys were playing at that time uh, because I was coaching minor hockey at the time. And even the, the uh, Adams, would run at each other rather than check each other. So the girls came up with a much, uh, much better uh, system. Mm -hmm. They actually learned how to stick handle and, and do the things that were needed. And, um, and that, whereas the boys were more intent on, on pounding each other. Yeah, need to be physical. But you even said the like, courts were involved to get girls to play, right? Yep. And, and that was just to fight up against hockey to say, hey, we, we need to let girls play this game and not against the physical boys. Was that the yeah. battle? That's right. And you know, that went on for many years um, where it took a court case to get uh, minor hockey to allow them to play girls on their team. What do you think of when you see now, you know, the Haley Wickenheisers of the world, our women's national team as recognizable almost as some of the men, and to see here in Poco the, and the Tri-City areas, to see how many teams there are at every level. I mean, how does that make you feel, knowing that, you know what, you had in the 70s used that station wagon and get kids to play and kind of started this whole thing? It makes me feel wonderful. The hardest thing at that time was getting referees. Mm -hmm. Nobody wanted to referee girls hockey. 
Just because it's the girls, it's not real hockey, probably, That's right. we thought. Is it easy to change people's mind? Um, I think it was because, uh, you know, things, things have all developed now. And, and that's all girls ice hockey is, is uh, adamant, as you say, the Wickenhausers and, the, and you know, some of the, the teams, it's, uh, it's especially, uh, it's gratifying to my, uh, to my daughter. Well, it must be, I mean, for your family, for you to be a big part of starting that. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, you were a referee for a long time, right? Oh, yes, I've been uh, refereeing. Uh, I was a uh, um, referee for uh, many benefit games, the Humboldt Broncos, and, uh, um, and also uh, for the Canuck alumni. And uh, what do you the, love about that? What did you love about refereeing and being a part of that, of hockey in that sense? Because I'm, you know, as you said, I, you coached. I think I enjoyed uh, refereeing most because uh, um, you got, uh, if you did a good job, uh, you know you did a good job, and and that was quite an accomplishment and you know, you didn't you didn't gauge it by how many guys called your names during the game but um, you they, know. they did probably though did they <laughs> yes <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. when you did a good job were there at least some nice guys to say nice job ref at the end of the game very rarely <laughs> it never changes but um, the last several years I did get that yeah thank yous and and stuff for doing it what was the reason where you started to go hey we need some old-timers hockey in poco mm -hmm. in fact i just stopped playing when the pandemic took over good for you so i played 48 years on the same team and uh, you didn't have to be very good and that and I was a better referee than a player. So that's when they got me into refereeing in the league. Mm -hmm. So I refereed in the league for maybe a dozen years. But again, I wanted too many changes. So, and, and that, uh, so then I did timekeeping for a few years and, and they asked me to be the president. So, uh, when they did, I, I changed a lot of things over to CARA, which is Canadian Adult Recreation Hockey Association. Yeah. Because uh, I've refereed for them across Canada, Quebec City, Edmonton, uh, Winnipeg, Calgary. So did that change kind of the competitiveness? of the league and just make it almost more recreational, enjoyable? Is that kind of what you, you did with the league? No, it's actually, uh, um, he gave us better rules to follow by mm -hmm. and that the constitution for the Monday Night League had been written up by some of those that didn't know the legal parts of the game. And that, so um, I rewrote the constitution and uh, we came up with the one that it is today. I guess the question to me is, I won't even guess how much time you've spent inside rinks. Whether you were refereeing, whether you were playing or coaching, I mean, you laugh. Would you not want I to guess how many I laugh because I'm years? looking at my wife. Yes. <laughs> well, good for you that she's been a part of all that. What was the joy you found? Did you find second families in all these teams and everything you did? No, not really. Um, I did with coaching. Yeah. Um, I did with uh, some of the um, organizations that I was working on because it was the same people helping you in baseball, lacrosse, hockey, and soccer, and and that. So. I was umpire in chief for quite a few years for minor baseball. Yeah. And um, I was equipment manager for minor hockey. 
for a few years. And that gave me a chance to meet all of these different people that were um, doers. Yeah. And when you find doers, you know, you find a direction for them to do it. <laughs> and I think that's where I was lucky. Well, you need the doers. And I think a lot of the times the doers don't get thanked. So this is so well deserved for this city to understand that you were a part of getting the girls in. You were a guy who made sure this is what old timers hockey is. So on behalf of everybody at Port Coquitlam, congratulations uh, of going into their Hall of Fame. It's well deserved. Thank you. I have had my pleasure out of it tenfold. <laughs>
is how to give back to the city. And that's why she's another one of our community leaders. And I've coached multiple sports um, at all different levels, and I'm qualified to coach all different kinds of sports at all different kinds of levels. It excites me. I love coaching. If, if I could get paid to coach, that would be the dream. What, what is it you love? Is, is it the meeting of the kids? Is it seeing them progress over eight months and seeing them, I'm, I'm sure, like, like you have from being eight years old to hopefully still playing at 14 to 15? What is the special bond that you have with them? I, I, I like that. Um, I like to find that one-on-one -on -one connection with my athletes. I like the difference between coaching uh, little kids. I really, I really like the, I really, really enjoy the three to eight is one of my favorite. I had 37 kids on my team last year in the three to eight year old category. I also really enjoy the challenge of coaching kids that are going through puberty and going through the hardest times of their teenage years, like in grade seven, eight, nine, ten. And then I really enjoy coaching adults in the 18 and over category where they're getting into college, they're getting in out of grade 12, they don't know what they do with their lives. And I love the difference between coaching female athletes and male athletes and co-ed teams. I do all three. Um, I would suspect it comes from how you were raised and your father and why you give so much to this community and what you love about it. Is, is that where it comes from, your, your push to, to give back? Yep, we have a long tradition. My mom still volunteers on many city councils and has done so for a long time, has been one of the administrative backbones in all of our sports. I've never traveled to a ringette tournament in my entire career. I started when I was about seven. I retired from playing in 1997 and I never went to one tournament without my mom. Not one, all over Canada. And when you go, as you get this community award, how proud are you or do they go, oh, where's, where's poor equipment? I, I would guess when people ask you about your hometown, what do you tell them? Because you are such a builder here and the family's been such a builder. Uh, well, I love my town. Everybody that knows me knows I love my town. Uh, I, I just tell them about what a great community it is, how many amenities we have here. I love that I can walk down, and you yourself said you went to the deli to have some supper with your team, and Maria knows all of my kids. I was in that deli the day after my daughter was born with the tag still on our wrist. I know that if my younger boys are downtown Poco and they need a hand, uh, they could go into multiple stores in downtown Poco or to the arena itself and say, hey, you know what, I need to use a phone, I need to call my mom, or hey, I love that people will walk up to my kids and go, oh, you're Michelle Bailey's daughter, you're Michelle McRae's daughter. My daughter works at a, at a craft store uh, just in Poco, and all the time people will come up and say, oh, you're Ashley McRae because they know, because my kids are out in the community, we're at all the civic events, we volunteer everywhere we can. Um, and and from the reverse, you probably can't go too far seeing someone ages eight to 20 without knowing them or they're gonna say hi to you. Like oh yeah, oh yeah, last season, my favorite, my, one of my very favorite things is, is when young adults that I've coached bring their kids and now I coach their kids. So when they bring their kids to the rink, they go, oh, you know what, Coach Michelle used to be mommy's coach. Coach Michelle, Michelle used to be daddy's coach. Those cameras were a massive reason why in Port Coquitlam, families were able to still connect. Take the kids to the rink, but you couldn't watch them play, you couldn't watch them practice until Andy Belser and a company of TELUS stepped up. As a sports parent myself, I realized how difficult it was not to be able to go see your children play. Difficult for the parents, the grandparents, and the children themselves. So at TELUS, we have different technology solutions that we look to provide to the community. And the impetus really came from the community itself. We had really great support from the hockey associations and ringette and lacrosse to be able to get some uh, video capabilities in there that people could then watch from home or, or on the go. It, it's, it seems so simple. We watch TV all the time at the pros, but this has to be great to go, hey, your kids are just as important. The time they put in is just as important. Was that what big connection for you and did you get great feedback from it? Yeah, we did get great feedback and actually appreciated a lot of what the pros do uh, day in and day out. Uh, it's one thing to go with your, iCam, uh, your iPhone camera and stream that to uh, uh, an open platform. 
but if you want to have something that follows the play and parents can recognize their kids and have a good quality production, and then for not only mom and dad to be able to see it, but sometimes uh, grandmother and grandfather to be able to see it at home as well. And to be able to have that on your TV service at home by just going to channel 1901, uh, we got really great feedback that the parents uh, appreciated it, but, but really the grandparents uh, appreciated it because they didn't have to go to some internet platform, try to figure out how that works. Uh, they were able to access it really easily. And it's on a shared medium as well. Uh, you can sit around the couch and enjoy the, enjoy the game together. I mean, it's always about connection. You're in telecommunications, that's what it's about. Do you think almost in a sense from a business standpoint, we've learned and, and the connection is even more so now as we go forward and it means more to us as it gets back to normal? Yeah, it's all about connection. You're right. That's I think what we're certainly in the business of is how do you connect Canadians to each other? Uh, so whether that's through an internet service or a mobile service, or in this case, it's a shared experience where you get to, to connect playing the sport as well, but all those who care about the kids playing the sport get to really have that meaningful connection. And, and we, we would see it, uh, we get feedback uh, both as a parent, but also as a, as a representative from Tell Us how much people really appreciated getting to share in that uh, connection. Your viewpoint about Port Coquitlam, because this is a town that really appreciates and uses sports as a wonderful model to make better community citizens and do things. And what you did obviously helped out, but do you see a, a unique sense of how Port Coquitlam takes itself and, and really centers around sports to help good and good and, and help the community and what they've done in the last 14 months? I think I have uh, personally a very high praise for the city of Port Coquitlam on a number of fronts. Uh, first of all, you know, a fantastic sports sporting facility that was just built and just gonna open up as COVID started to take, uh, take, take place and really impact us all. And, and you know, geez, in one sense, it's like, wow, it's really too bad uh, that you know, we can't use that facility to the fullest. But you know, kudos and credit to the, not only the city, but the, the user groups who use that facility really came together, a very collaborative effort. And you could see uh, you know, how much the city themselves were pushing to get the, the cameras in so that the, the uh, uh, community could, could enjoy it. Uh, but you know, we've had a long-term partnership uh, with the city of, of Fort Coquitlam, and it was one of our first fiber to the home communities. So the fact that um, you know, we have a, a broad fiber to the home network throughout Port Coquitlam, uh, you know, coupled with uh, you know, some really great innovation on the sporting front, I think just you know, brings it all together really nicely for the, for the citizens who live here. Our thanks to TELUS and Andy for stepping up in Port Coquitlam so there could be that connection and the share through social media. How good would it be to give a grandparent and see your granddaughter or son play when you normally couldn't do that? Now let's look at some other great volunteers in Port Coquitlam. Dave Clark, Poco Ridge Meadows Ringette Association. Heather Fox, Tri-City Predators Ice Hockey. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> Liz Partridge from TC North Basketball. Curtis Uretta, Titan Softball. Rob Berusian, Poco Tennis Club. The field here at Gates Park, the home of Port Coquitlam softball, obviously soccer, baseball played here. Get to the arenas, it's the home of sports. And that was the home for John Bailey. That was pretty much it. Whether he was umping or he was refing or he was organizing, he was giving back to this city. And that's why John Bailey is going into the Sports Hall of Fame. He lived the right way in giving back. And as his family says, that's all he needs. John was a giver from day one when he got on the fire department. If they needed volunteers for something, it was a yes. And then before we had children, our neighbor uh, needed some help with his daughter's softball team and said, do you think you could come down and give me a hand? I can't get any parents. Yep, off he went. And then we had our own children and, and it just followed through. My dad used to coach before I was born. He coached women's softball. So my very first memory 
one of my first memories is sitting in the back of his blue Ford pickup truck in the bed of the truck, because that's how we traveled around in those days, because Poco was barely anything back then. Uh, sitting in the back with my little brother in my lap with all the girls in the back of the truck and he would drive from the field and he would drive them over to the Tasty Freeze for like a 10 cent cone or 25 cent pick a pop. Uh, so that's one of my most earliest memories uh, of, of loving sport and loving coaching and loving that interaction with the athlete. We were always the first ones there and the last ones to leave because he was my coach. But we would drive around Mary Hill picking up every player that needed a ride. He would bring snacks in case anybody hadn't eaten yet. So when you're there that early, you might as well help out with the team that's on the ice before you are. If you're there watching your brother play and there's kids somewhere else, then you might as well do some paperwork to help out with the association or pitch in and help coach the younger kids that are on the other side or on the other rink or on the other field. So you might as well give back and do something rather than sit and watch. He just did it because that's just the way he was. Everybody knew my dad and my dad was actually very big in umpiring. So if you were to go back and ask anybody uh, that played with me or mostly played with Melanie as well about John Bailey, they'd be like, oh, he's the umpire. And my dad used to smoke cigars. He would never light them. He used to have these big white owl cigars, right? And so they would know, oh yeah, no, that's, that's Mr. Bailey. Oh, that's Mr. Bailey. And we better be respectful and we're all gonna get kicked out and the whole nine yards if you're not, you know, you gotta play by the rules and you gotta be respectful to the referees and the coaches and everybody. And, and that was a big thing. I don't know where he got his energy from. He used to tire me out just watching him go, go, go. Even, even when he was very ill, he, he went to Alaska to, to set up the World Winter Games for Special Olympics. He was everywhere, and he was the loudest guy in the room. If he was in the rink, you knew it. I think back sometimes to, to Special Olympics. Uh, the Olympians, they loved him. I know we walked into a, into a tournament, and they just beam, and, and they would yell, John, John, and they would hug him, and they just, he had so much respect for them. Um, he was so kind and uh, that's one of my better memories for sure and we would uh, when a good friend so and Gill uh, was involved with WLA and and he phoned John and he said oh man I need some help we need a commissioner for the WLA for the Adnax oh yeah okay I'll do it no problem well then could you know could you do this could you okay fine we'd do that we'd go to the lacrosse games especially in New Westminster and uh, the, the Special Olympians were there and they'd see him come in the door and they would just break out in a smile and just be so happy to see him and that must have made him, well it did make him feel he was, good. He was such a big tour de force. I was talking with my kids about that today. He, he was like a big linchpin of it all, right? Like a fulcrum point where people just gravitate that way. He just made it so enjoyable and so fun and he made you want to be better and play harder and work harder and try this. If, if John was alive today, he would be so proud of the three kids, Michelle, David, and Melanie, for what they've accomplished and, and what they will continue to accomplish. I think his, his greatest pleasure, if he had lived, would be his eight grandchildren that he never got. Because you know he would be there. He would be he there would coaching be there. or something. Right? Oh man, he would be there. He would have been tossed off the field a few times, I'm sure, <laughs> because he was never quiet. That's for sure. Um, I don't know. I like to think we brought the kids up to give, to to give back. As large as he was, and as loud as he was, and how everywhere he was, he was a pretty humble guy. I think he would take it to heart, but very shy about it. Oh, he, he would be tickled pink by this. It, it wouldn't be something he would ever expect at all, but he would be super proud to know that all of his grandkids and all the kids and now adults whose lives that he touched, and there were many, many, uh, he'd be super proud that they'll be able to go through the, the Porco Quilton Rec Complex, our beautiful new complex, and be able to see that and bring that up and call that up. And when my brother comes down from the north, he can bring my nieces and he can be like, look, this is Grandpa John. This is, this is what he did for our community, for all of our sports.
It has been amazing to uh, see the stories, to see the people who really make up the fabric of this community in this award show. It never surprises me what Port Coquitlam can do. The spirit that they have, and really we've told that story of what they've done over the last 16 months when they didn't get a chance to compete, when they didn't get a chance to play, they did more to propel their community forward. Rest assured, we'll meet again. I'll put on a tuxedo. We'll go into the Terry Fox Theater and we will celebrate everything that is great about Port Coquitlam and this wonderful sports community.